So welcome to the Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. My name is Dave Ebert, I'm a senior research scientist, emphasis on the word. And uh, welcome to the last talk in the 2017 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Uh, it's been my experience this year that we've covered a, a huge amount of uh, ground, paleontologically as well as geologically, so it it kind of makes sense, it's appropriate, I think, that we, um, that we end up with a talk that touches on human origins and diversification, and that is the, uh, a talk centered on the 2015 discovery of Homo nilotti, a new species of hominin from a deep, inaccessible cave system in the cradle of humankind in South Africa. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Eric Roberts. Eric is an associate professor and head of the Geosciences Department at James Cook University in Queensland, Australia. Uh, Eric is also 15 and a half hours ahead of us <laughs> with jet lag, so if he falls asleep during the talk, <laughs> you'll just have to forgive him. He'll wake up eventually. Um, he's originally from Colorado in the USA, and uh, he obtained his degrees from Cornell College, University of Montana, and the University of Utah. His main research focuses in on the sedimentology and stratigraphy of dinosaur-bearing Cretaceous strata in Western North America, particularly in Utah and Montana. And as you can tell by today's talk, he's also very interested and involved in hominid and anthropoid bearing deposits in the East African Rift. Uh, area and in um, the cradle of humankind. Uh, it's a geographic area in South Africa. Eric's talk today is entitled Discovery, Geological Context and Challenges of Dating a New Hominin, Homo nilotti, and uh, from the Rising Star Cave, thank you Francois, uh, in South Africa. The talk is an overview of the discovery of the Homo nilotti and uh, the efforts that have gone into unraveling the geological context of the cave system, as well as the complexities of dating this incredibly important new hominin that uh, has been featured in National Geographic and was recognized as one of the top 10 science discoveries in 2015. So join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Roberts. All right, thanks. Cool. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming along. Uh, certainly, I'm delighted to uh, tell you a story about this discovery and some of the work that has gone into uh, trying to understand uh, uh, why these fossils are in this chamber and, and uh, how old the fossils are. Um, so most of the presentation, what I want to do is talk to you about uh, the original discovery and what it, what it was like uh, finding these fossils, um, excavating them, uh, and then trying to understand why the fossils were in the cave. And then at the end, I want to uh, provide you a little bit of a primer of some very exciting uh, new um, results from the project uh, that were supposed to only be announced uh, in, in a couple weeks' time. But uh, have, some of these things have been leaked to the, to the media in the last few days. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of an update on, on some of the things that are, are happening in this project that are quite exciting. So we'll finish up with that. Um, so these are the two papers that uh, came out uh, in, at the end of 2015. And it's significant because, of course, in human evolution, much of our fossil record is based on very fragmentary and very limited uh, material. It's, it's nothing like uh, Dinosaur Park, where you have uh, skeletons upon skeletons um, and, and a tremendous amount of material. Many hominin uh, or hominid fossils are based on, in many cases, only parts of a jaw, uh, portions of a skeleton, a few bones here and there. Um, what makes this spectacular, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain it a little bit more uh, as I go along, is the sheer volume of material found uh, in this uh, new deposit. So we had two papers, one on uh, the announcement of a new species of human ancestor, 
and then another one trying to understand why it's there. For that poetry. And, and in South Africa, this made a, a great deal of news. And I just have and a little video clip outstanding um, work. from and the vice president the uh, sort of talking about the discovery. Paleontologists around the world, and you will have your discussions and fights and all that. But for us, <laughs> for us mere people, normal people for that matter, uh, this, this chamber really gives us a window of understanding our past, beginning to gain more knowledge about our present moment, and also gives us an insight of what our future could look like. For us to understand how the species lived right here in South Africa, right here on the African continent, is something that is a great, great step for us. And one could echo what was once said, that this could well be a small step for Naledi. Naledi took a small step into that chamber, but for us, as the people of the world, this is a gigantic step to understand who we are. And, and lastly, I'd like to, uh, to thank National Geographic, eLife, of course, Liebeger and his team, but more importantly, the University of the Witwatersrand, Professor Habib, for making this open and available to the whole world. Researchers do not have to buy these papers. They just log in and get everything free on hand. And I want to repeat what the good professor said, that knowledge should be made easily, cheaply, available all the time to all the people of the world. Seven billion people. Okay, so the, the point of that last bit is um, hominins are sort of one of, one of science's most glamorous, I suppose, uh, uh, um, or, or paleontology's most glamorous specimens. And so they're rare, they're hard to find, uh, and many people find uh, sort of that history of our own evolution quite fascinating. So typically, uh, a find of this nature would be published in Nature or Science or something like that. Um, the lead uh, on this project, Professor uh, Berger from Witts University, decided that we're going to publish these papers uh, fully open access in eLife. And that was really a, a change from the from the norm. And the other thing about this project that was a change from the norm is that often when new hominids are found, they're studied for tens of years um, before they actually publish uh, uh, anything about them. So they're really meticulously studied. Um, and it's usually done in a very uh, cloistered, very uh, small network of people. Um, this project took a very different track. It invited uh, literally dozens of early career researchers to get involved in studying and describing uh, the skeleton as well as the geological context. Uh, and so that's one of the things that um, I think makes this project fairly unique and, and, and special in the sense of hominid uh, paleontology or paleoanthropology. So let me take you to the site where all this happened. Here's South Africa, and the site is just northwest of Johannesburg. So um, uh, very close to this large city. And then we typically think of the Great Rift Valley or East Africa as being sort of the home of, 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 of human evolution or um, the cradle of humankind. But in fact, the very first um, discoveries of our ancestors, hominids, were, were found or discovered actually outside of Johannesburg. So that's why it's called the Cradle of Humankind. Uh, it was the initial discovery site, and that's where paleoanthropology really began. So <clears throat> to give you a little bit of a view, this is this area here, and it's referred to as the Cradle of Humankind. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And all of these numbers represent uh, cave localities with hominid fossils that have been found uh, over the years. And then all of these dots represent caves that have fossils, but not necessarily uh, hominid fossils in them. So it's an incredibly rich uh, paleontological 
uh, uh, locality or area. And one of the things and one of the reasons why people haven't heard a lot about South Africa as being the cradle of humankind for many years is that for a long period of time, there was a uh, sort of sense we found all the fossils in, in South Africa. They only come <clears throat> from these few cave systems. And uh, we searched for over 100 years or close to 100 years. Um, we're not going to find anything new. So the emphasis really shifted to East Africa. And uh, really from, from the 1940s, I suppose, uh, until now, East Africa has been the, the place where most new discoveries have come from. However, um, since about 2010, when my uh, colleagues, uh, myself included, I was at Wits University teaching it uh, just before that as well, started systematically mapping these caves and saying, well, look, maybe there are different types of caves that preserve fossils than the ones that we typically go back to time and time again. So Lee Berger, uh, Paul Dirks, myself, and others started looking at some of these other cave systems and almost immediately using a GIS type approach, uh, we started finding new fossiliferous caves and um, including uh, a very famous locality referred to as Malapa in 2010, which produced uh, another new hominid species, uh, Australopithecus sediba. So that really kicked off this period of discovery. And I would argue that uh, really, we're only coming into the golden age of, of discovery in South Africa now that we've sort of diversified how we're looking for fossils there. Um, and really, the, probably the next four or five or ten years, most of the exciting new discoveries, I predict, will come out of South Africa rather than East Africa. Um, so a little bit of background on why we have fossils in South Africa. It's not a rift valley. It's not actively uh, preserving a great deal of sediment. What it is, is it's a high elevation plateau. And that high elevation plateau is made up of limestone. So this big yellow band here, so here's Johannesburg. This is the Johannesburg Dome. And this swath of rock is a Proterozoic uh, Dolomite, or limestone. And that's been lifted up to almost a kilometer, uh, excuse me, almost a mile above sea level. And that landscape is actively uh, eroding very, very slowly, and we're getting cave formation occurring in that limestone. And so over time, what happens is you may get uh, um, a series of fractures. And as the water table moves up and down, those fractures expand as water uh, fills those caverns and then uh, as it drains out of them. And with time, you go from having sort of water-filled uh, chambers to, as the water table drops, stalactites and stalagmites, speleothems filling in those chambers. And then ultimately, as these fractures continue to grow, you might create uh, access points to surface. So the traditional caves in South Africa, you've gotten what we call a roof chamber, which can be a death trap, where animals can fall into these caves, and you can create a situation where lots of animal bones, or maybe not lots, but animal bones can fall into these and be preserved by the drip water, the speleothem, that then spreads out across this. So this is the traditional model of where you find fossils in Southern African caves. But just having a look, there are other chambers that don't necessarily have these breccia deposits or these uh, roof collapse chambers. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, sort of a different model of, of, of fossil chamber in South Africa. So this is a close-up view of a certain area in the cradle of humankind called Bolt's Farm uh, and, uh, sorry, not Bolt's Farm, um, Rising Star. And this gray area here represents the outline of the cave system underground. These yellow areas represent dolomite with chert, and the white represent dolomite uh, without chert. And this is just a map of the surface. And so what we see below the surface is a very extensive cave network. And um, this is the Dinalady chamber where the fossils that I'm going to be talking about were discovered. And you can see this is the entry point. Uh, here's a scale here. It's about 80 meters there. It's about 75 meters as you go uh, from the entry to 
the cave chamber, and it's about um, 35 uh, meters below the surface. So this is not a straight line, though. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to get into there. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that because it's, it's uh, not easy. And this is an outline of the chamber here where the fossils were found. And these represent the main fossil burying areas. But fossils were literally found uh, almost everywhere in the chamber. So this is what it looks like at the surface. Um, this is the Malmani Dolomite. And for the most part, there are no big chambers or big uh, openings at the surface other than the way we get in. There are a few um, areas where we do see some sort of uh, soil uh, falling down, uh, I suppose, and, and maybe a fracture system, but no large chambers where animals could fall into today. Okay, so this is what the chamber looks like in cross section. This is our entrance here, and there are a number of actual entrances, but the one you would go through um, is fairly uh, challenging to get through. And this is one of the really interesting parts about this discovery, is you go from surface, and you make your way down slowly, and you get to a point here where you have a crawl uh, that is really limiting. Most people won't be able to get through that point. This is called the Superman crawl, um, and this is a photo of myself going through that. Uh, it's called the Superman crawl because you literally have to do a Superman pose, put one arm in front of the other so your shoulders fit through. Otherwise, you can't uh, get through. And if you're large-bodied, uh, you're not going to get through at all. So it really, right off the uh, bat, starts restricting what can get in there. And as you might imagine, there's no light coming in. This is a completely dark cave system. You enter into this very large chamber system called the Dragon's Back Chamber. And when you get to this dragon's back chamber, there's a rock climb. Uh, you have to climb up this back or this fin of rock called the dragon's back. Here's a picture of one of the cavers doing it. Um, you can see there's a bolt. It's, it's, it's not easy. So it's, it's a challenge to climb up. Then you wiggle your way through this um, crack, and you get back, and you look down, and you see this. And that is 18 inches, uh, 18 centimeters wide. So Imagine this, you could not get your head through um, head on. You have to turn your head sideways to be able to get your head through. Um, and so that narrow shaft is a 12 to 13 meter down climb. So you have to rock climb down a vertical fracture to get into the chamber. So of course, the biggest question that everybody has right off the bat is, why on earth are these fossils in there? How did they get in there? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, in more detail. So the key is that it is no simple task to get into this cave. This is a laser scan that we did through much of the chamber. We couldn't get the laser scanner through that last bit. It was just too narrow. But this will hopefully give you guys an idea of what it's like to crawl through this ca cave ch chamber uh, or a cave system and decide for yourselves why these animals were in here, uh, maybe what they were doing in this cave system. So we're just looking at the entry now. Uh, and then in a moment, what we'll do is we'll actually start going the route that the cavers uh, and excavators and scientists would take to get into the chamber, and presumably that Homo naledi would have taken to get into that chamber. All these little golf ball looking things are uh, the different stations that were used um, when the scan was, was produced. So very narrow passages, um, uh, such that your back and your belly are going to be touching as you, as you squeeze through these. There's a ladder there for one particular segment. And again, we're moving down quite consistently through this cave chamber. Uh, and now we're going to uh, get into some pretty narrow places. This is the Superman crawl here. Uh, and again, that will probably restrict about 50% of you know, the population from ever getting into this uh, particular cave, and that's not the narrowest bit. So now we're in the Dragon's Back Chamber, this large uh, chamber before we have to climb up 
And what we'll do is we'll just have a look around this just to see you, show you how big it is. All right, so <clears throat> what we're going to start doing is climbing up the dragon's back. And it'll give you a, a bit of an idea what it takes to get up uh, the dragon's back. So we'll climb onto this pillar here and start rock climbing up this pillar. It continues on. It's quite an extensive climb. Go around a few blocks and have to squeeze our way back into this passage. And then this is where we would go down. Now, the laser scanner uh, can't fit down there. Um, but this is a point cloud showing you the cave system. This is just where we went in, and that would be the drop into the dragon's back chamber. This is the dragon's back itself, so that's where we climbed up and back. Um, so this is the dragon's back chamber. Here's coming up the Superman crawl. And then moving our way to the surface. This starry field that you're seeing is the surface of the ground. Gives you an idea that there are really no fracture systems connecting to the surface. We're able to use laser scanners in all of the different uh, parts of the cave system to see if there's any access to surface. Uh, and that's one of the criticisms that a lot of other scientists have posed. Well, how do you know there aren't any other access to this cave system? And the answer that, that we'll give you, and, and I think this goes a long way towards showing that, uh, because they're not there. Uh, we've looked. Um, one thing I won't be able to show you, we've also taken geophysical instruments uh, over don't have any evidence of, of fractures large enough for any animals to have gotten into. Uh, I'll explain that in more detail in a moment. Okay, so now what we're doing is uh, just looking using a drone. So we've put the laser scanner on a drone and are looking at the surface of the uh, uh, farm above. So this is the cave system below the surface. These are trees. That's the dolomite. Here's the entrance right here. And again, we've run geophysics across the surface. And we've also dated all the fractures with speleothems on surface. And they're all very, very old speleothems. So they weren't open uh, for over a million years. So we're quite confident at this stage that the surface uh, as we know it today is very similar to the surface at the time that Naledi would have entered the chamber. So this is a, um, a Stephen Hunter who actually discovered the fossils, a recreational caver um, who's going into these caves uh, for fun. Um, and after doing this now myself, uh, maybe 30 or 40 times in and out, I would not do this for fun. Uh, I, I, <clears throat> I know that it's fun for these guys, but uh, this guy is considerably skinnier than I am, and uh, it's, it's no mean feat to get into this. So here's uh, Stephen and then the other guy who helped discover the chamber, Rick. So what they were doing is they had known about this chamber uh, for a number of years. They'd heard about it, but they never had the, uh, uh, I guess, the gumption to go and, and try this down climb uh, passage until... Uh, this particular day in 2013 when they decided, look, we're going to give it a whirl. And they made it in. And when those guys got into this cave chamber, well, when those guys got into the cave chamber, uh, what they saw was a whole bunch of bones on the surface. And so they took a few photos and they took those photos back uh, to one of their colleagues or friends in the caving community who happened to also be doing a master's uh, with Professor Lee Berger um, related to hominid uh, stuff. So he knew immediately that this was pretty significant. He took the photos to Lee Berger, and Lee 
uh, within about three seconds of seeing the photos, it was like, we need to go back in right now. Uh, so they went back, got more photos, and uh, Lee got on the phone. He's a National Geographic explorer in residence. Uh, had a chat with uh, the, the head of National Geographic uh, exploration at the time. And they basically wrote him a blank check uh, to get a caving team in there to uh, begin excavation. So because it is such an incredibly tight uh, chamber, Lee put out a, uh, an, an ad, essentially, on the internet saying, look, we're looking for small, delicate people with paleontology or archaeology or anthropology background. And the next morning, his, his inbox was essentially flooded with everything from paleoanthropologists, paleontologists, and archaeologists to any other uh, person um, who wasn't quite sure what that ad was all about. But at the end of the day, he got a team of postdoctoral researchers, PhD students, uh, who had caving skills and were able to go in. So they, they, they dubbed these people underground astronauts. Uh, of course, when National Geographic took the photos, um, they failed to recognize that there was a geologist also uh, climbing into this cave chamber and working alongside these folks. But it's, it's not quite as good a media um, uh, in this sense. So, there's me, uh, also uh, went into this chamber. And so the, the, the six of us are the only people um, that really did work in this until about 20, 2016, uh, when we started getting more PhD students and researchers involved in the project. And this is what it looked like. All these are bones. Um, and the cavers themselves put a few of them on the surface. This is their original photo that they took. And um, then ultimately, uh, went in and chose a spot to excavate that looked like it had the most um, uh, likelihood of, of, of actually preserving bone in the subsurface. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, what they did is they ran a whole series of cables and wires uh, so that the people on the outside, like Lee Berger, who couldn't get into the chamber, could actually follow along and see what was going on. And so everything was recorded as they went. And there were over 300 hominid fossils on the surface that they first had to go through and pick up. And so once they completed that, uh, they began a test excavation. And there's Lee uh, sitting, having a look uh, from the command center, as he called it. Um, and ultimately, this is what came out of uh, two, essentially just two excavations in the cave chamber, two, three-week uh, excavations produced the single largest uh, hominid uh, fossil discovery in Africa. Okay, so this actually this accumulation uh, almost exceeds all other fossils from the cradle of humankind. So at the end of the day, um, there was over 1,550 hominid bones uh, produced, uh, representing uh, at a minimum 15 individuals. So really spectacular discovery. Now this is a composite not a single uh, skeleton. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit more about in a moment, is the taphonomy, uh, what the context of these fossils uh, was in the chamber itself. So this is a, a forensic scientist's uh, reconstruction of the uh, face of Homo naledi. So that's what, that's what we think naledi looked like. Um, these are the two best. Uh, cranial remains that we have. So some very beautiful material, lots of mandibles, um, uh, jaw fragments, and, and parts of the cranium all broken apart. But nonetheless, a, a lot of material to work off of. And so just a sampling of the dental remains. There's over 150 uh, teeth that were pulled out of this. Um, and if you were to just count the total number of teeth out of East Africa, um, from early uh, hominins, I suspect it wouldn't add up to this. Um, so a lot of individuals, clearly. So not all of the material is broken up. Uh, we have some beautifully articulated material alongside all of that disarticulated and broken material, including uh, some very nice uh, limbs, some very nice uh, hands and feet. So uh, 
Very interesting hand. And the first thing that the paleoanthropologists noticed when they looked at some of this material is it looked incredibly human-like. Okay? So um, if you would have looked at this hand uh, and compared it to your own, there's very little difference. The only difference, uh, or the, the main difference, is that the tips of the fingers are a little bit more curved. But beyond that, it's a very human-looking uh, hand. Similarly, the foot is quite human-looking or human-like, I should say. Uh, the skull, if you ignored the brain size of the animal uh, and compared this to other hominins or hominids, uh, what you would say is it, it looks more like ourselves than it looks like uh, many other hominids, certainly more than it looks like Australopithecines. However, the real big game changer here is the size of the brain. Uh, it's tiny. So probably a number of you, if not uh, quite a few of you, have heard of uh, the hobbit uh, fossils from Flores. Uh, another uh, very famous example of a small-brained hominin, um, but not from Africa. So this is the first really small-brained hominin um, uh, from Africa. And we'll tell you a little bit more about this. But it's interesting that it has such human-like or, or homo sapien-like uh, features. If we just look at the skeleton overall, it's really a mosaic of what we might think of as evolved features and primitive features. As I said, um, you know, the feet and the hands, these are tool, this is a, this is a tool user's hand. It's very much like our own. Uh, long legs, you know, the, the classic concept is as humans sort of evolved from uh, apes, you move out of uh, the trees and into uh, savannas and you need upright stance to look for predators and things of that nature. Um, so very upright, very long legs, similar to uh, what we think of our, as, as advanced uh, homo. But then you look at the hip, um, you have a hip that is oriented more towards the horizontal, which is much more of a primitive trait. Um, similarly, uh, shoulder or shoulder girdle uh, that's much more primitive, much more ape-like. And so this very unique combination of future features is what uh, led Berger and, and the rest of the team to determine that this is probably a new species, something we haven't seen before. And just to give you a little bit of an artist's uh, viewpoint, what this might have looked like, now this is Australopithecus afarensis. This is the most famous, I would argue, of all hominids. Uh, this is Lucy uh, from... Ethiopia, discovered by Donald Johansson. Um, and this is an Australopithecine, what we think of as a primitive uh, hominid. And standing next to uh, Lucy is Turconoboy, which is a Homo erectus uh, fossil. So uh, Homo erectus would have been a much larger brained, taller, long legged uh, member of our own genus, Homo. And then we have Naledi which would be somewhere in between, it looks like. Uh, much smaller brain size than Erectus, um, so more similar in many ways to the brain size that we might see in Australopithecines, yet has these long legs, um, tool user hands. Very interesting uh, animal. So this is really where I come in, and um, my team, I suppose, understand why they're new hominid uh, Africa. And that's what I want to talk to you about, really. That's the real focus of my work. Um, so let's just go back and remember, here's the entrance. We go through, uh, have to go up and over. I've, I've turned my light off many times. There's no light diffusion into the cave system. So it makes you wonder, why 15 individuals are sitting in this cave uh, in this uh, uh, deep, deep, really challenging to access uh, um, place. And the other thing that's very important in this is that there's no other fauna. All of the other cave sites that have hominids in South Africa uh, are characterized by far more faunal remains than there are hominid remains. So gazelle, uh, antelope of, of different types, um, actually, a whole variety of different animals typically associated with these other hominid deposits. What makes the Naledi 
uh, deposit or the dentelady chamber unique is that it lacks all other fauna. The only thing that we have are um, some microfossils of rodents. Okay, so uh, uh, rodent bones and part of an owl wing. So that's that's all that is in there besides the actual hominid material. I just want to go back and show you one thing. So this is this is the dentelady chamber, what we refer to the fossil chamber. These pink dots represent places where there was large concentrations of uh, hominin material right on surface, or naledi material on the surface. And this is where we actually excavated. Um, and to date, there's only been one excavation, and it's about, well, it's, it's expanded a bit, but half a meter by half a meter by about that deep. Okay? So those 1,550 specimens have been taken off the surface, and of those, over 1,200 of those came from that single excavation pit. So it really uh, is exciting to think about when full excavation really takes place, how many, how many uh, individuals are probably going to be in this chamber and what else we're going to find. Okay, so what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about the geology. We really have uh, two distinct types of rock in the chamber or three, I suppose. We have the dolomite, so this is what the cave is, is eroded and weathered um, walls of the cave. So this is the Malmani dolomite. This orange material is what happens when you weather that dolomite uh, and dissolve out the calcium carbonate. What remains is mostly silton clay, and uh, that is the silton clay that is mostly a weathering product. And we have a PhD student right now that's doing lots of experiments, weathering blocks of limestone to see what comes out. And we can, well, he'll be able to, to, to write some papers on this, but it's pretty clear that's the weathering product from doing this. So the question that everybody should have, and we certainly did, is where's the sediment coming from? Is it coming from outside the chamber, or is it being produced just simply by weathering and formation of the chamber? And that has a lot of importance if we're trying to figure out where the fossils are coming from. Are the fossils being washed into the chamber, or are they making their way on their own somehow, or, or uh, what's going on? So you can see this is laminated mudstone, what we call unit one. And then what happens when this dries out is it breaks into blocks. And when it breaks into blocks, it gets redeposited in a rock type that we call a breccia. Okay? And so this breccia is essentially nothing but broken up, um, weathered pieces of this. So if we look on the floor here, what we'll see, as that breaks up and dries out, it forms a whole bunch of little blocks that then may be cemented together by flowstone, uh, drip water uh, that's enriched in calcium carbonate, and it can preserve that as crust. So we see just two rock types, essentially. Now our job is to figure out the age of those rock types and, and how they fit together in terms of fossils and where the fossils fit. So um, what we know is we have these two rock types, and this unit here is always forming. Okay? As you start weathering the cave, it's going to be forming from the very beginning uh, to present, to right now, whereas these units uh, are probably a little bit more distinct. They have episodes of time when you probably wet and dry uh, this material and brecciate it. So we know that we have at least two units of that, and now we know we have a third. Uh, this one is much older, and this one appears to be much younger. This is the uh, unit that preserves most of the fossils, or all of the fossils. So here's what we see. That's that breccia, and if we look at that breccia of unit two, we've got one or two faunal remains in it, so not hominin, uh, and it looks very similar to this material that we see here and here, which we find on the floor of the cave, and this is what preserves uh, the hominin material. So it's a, it's a complex and tricky situation. Um, this is an articulated hand that we see there. Okay. If we look at the cave floor, what we see is a bunch of these little blocks, breccia blocks, these clasts that form, and then there's lots of little bone fragments. So all of those represent bone fragments. And to make things even more complex, if you see this, this is flowstone that's sitting below that. So we know at one period of time we had flowstones coming in, and yet 
these rocks continue to erode onto the chamber. So caves are really complex depositional systems um, that are unlike what we see outside here in the Badlands. In the Badlands, uh, what we think of as stratigraphy or the law of superposition is those units on the bottom should be the oldest and everything successively above that should be younger. But in caves, sedimentation and stratigraphy doesn't work that way. Oftentimes you'll dissolve things from underneath or you'll erode things from underneath because they're being held up or, or essentially cemented in place by these flowstones. So we have to really look at things a little bit differently than certainly is my background working in Badland type of uh, geological environments. So it turns out this unit here on the roof is our oldest unit um, that we can diagnose in the chamber. And so uh, I'll come back to that. And then these units below it are actually younger. So uh, these are the units that preserve the fossils. Right up in here, it's a bit hard to see, but we have Homo naledi bones that are overgrown by this flowstone. And that's a really good thing because we can date that flowstone. As that flowstone drips and forms, it forms calcite crystals. And in those calcite crystals, we trap small amounts of radiogenic uh, material, uranium. And as that uranium starts decaying, uh, it will basically uh, provide a means for us to measure the uh, radioactive isotopes versus the stable daughter products that are produced in those calcite crystals. So we have a way of dating this perhaps, and I'll come back to this later. So the question at hand is, did the sediment come from outside, and hence did the fossils come with it in some sort of flooding event or wash-in, or is the material in the cave chamber produced only by weathering primarily of the dolomite? And we did a couple of experiments, um, and we looked at the geology of the dragon's back chamber, that large chamber uh, that we had to crawl up the dragon's back to get to, and we looked at, sorry, I should say the sedimentology of the Denilady chamber, and we did a series of uh, geochemical experiments. And what we found, this is the Denilady chamber, is that all of the sediment is clay. We don't see very much quartz at all, and that quartz is coming from the surface. Okay, it's washing into the cave system from outside the cave. Whereas if we look at the dragon's back chamber, um, all that we see is the clay that's formed from weathering. So what we believe is that this was an isolated system. We don't see any evidence that sediment was making its way from any other parts of the cave system or from the surface into the Denilady chamber. We have excellent evidence to suggest that it made it into the dragon's back chamber and many of the other chambers in the cave system, but not this fossil bearing uh, part of the chamber. So a little bit of a cartoon, what we, this is what we see now. What we think happened is um, more or less this chamber filled up in different places, not full to the brim, but full of this unit one. As the chamber weathers, it fills up, and then this material here, this mudstone, basically dries out and it brecciates, and it just builds up on the chamber floor. But the really interesting thing, in the chamber floor are drains, okay? So the chamber is actively draining from below. So at some periods of time, these, these drains are essentially clogged, but then they'll open up and material will start down cutting essentially and uh, uh, leaving the chamber. So we've got a very complex stratigraphy, but when the material came in, um, what we think is that a lot of the material came in articulated. It didn't come in in any sort of flood. Uh, it came in quite articulated. And then as the chamber has essentially dropped and we get erosion out of the chamber, we're concentrating some of these bones just in this unit. And we're only seeing probably a fraction of what was there um, a few hundred thousand years ago. Okay, so what other evidence? Well, again, we've got articulated elements. So here's a nice leg, an articulated uh, leg here. Um, we have upright bones, so it's very interesting. Here is uh, the top of a jaw fragment. You can see the teeth there, this long limb bone. And below that was this um, hand and foot. And so in one part of the cave, in the excavation pit, we literally have an articulated hand and foot with an upright uh, femur. 
very interesting uh, what's happening here. And it's not to say that, you know, you could make the assumption that this animal sat down in there uh, and was buried essentially in life position. I don't know that that's true, but that's what it looks like. Um, so uh, interesting mix of taphonomic signals because so much of the bone is also just scattered throughout the chamber. When we look at the features on the bone, we see a lot of staining. Uh, and that mineral staining is just common to cave systems where you have a lot of manganese oxide in the cave. And uh, it will stain the bone when it's buried in the sediment. But as it gets to the surface, a lot of that bone um, will lose that staining. It'll be somewhat washed. And that's a perfect refit of a bone, one found on surface, one found in the excavation pit, that tells us that things are being reworked. There's some movement going on here. Um, Lots of dry bone fractures, but no green breaks. No evidence of trauma, no evidence of carnivores or, or other animals breaking the bone to get at the marrow. Um, but what we do see is signs of insects uh, getting to these. And many of us, myself included, would think that that was direct evidence that these things were outside the chamber uh, as fleshy carcasses before they got in. However, after spending uh, uh, many weeks now in this chamber, I've seen the most bizarre insects uh, in the chamber itself. So it, it doesn't surprise me now, uh, or it doesn't make me believe that this had to be at surface. In fact, just the opposite. So it turns out we can now reconstruct these borings or, or traces to um, cave-dwelling beetles and other insects. Okay. So no carnivore marks, no cut marks. Uh, and no green fractures. So that leads us to the punchline. How did these fossils, how did these animals get into the cave system? And so we really wanted to take a very open approach to this and just rule out what we could and leave open uh, the other possibilities. So the first question, were they living in there? And the answer is, well, we don't have any evidence of that. It doesn't seem like it. It would be a heck of a journey in and out. Um, takes about 20 minutes to go in and about 30 plus minutes to get out, um, uh, no charcoal, no hearths, no stone tools, uh, really no evidence that they were living in there. Um, did they get transported in by water? And the answer is no. Uh, sedimentologically, it's a very unique, isolated cave system. Uh, we don't have any of the coarse grain material that we see in the nearby chambers. So I didn't mention this, but in the dragon's back chamber, we have gravels, we have conglomerate. Uh, that's quartz based. And so all in here are lots of gravels, but do we see any of that making its way into the Dinalady chamber? The answer is no. We don't think there was connectivity between these uh, chambers, certainly not from surface. Okay? Um, then the most common accumulator of bones in the cradle of humankind and in caves around the world are predators. Um, predators all over the world today will take. Uh, carcasses or remains to caves where they'll accumulate or these bones can accumulate in quite large quantities. So that was really uh, the hypothesis for most of the cradle of humankind fossil sites is that probably they're predator accumulations. Okay? The other main hypothesis that many people often suggest are death trap scenarios. And the most common scenario would be a uh, a roof chamber that is collapsed, allowing animals to fall in and basically uh, take a long fall and die in the chamber, and maybe even if they don't die, not be able to get out. And this is also a common scenario worldwide. But again, we do see evidence of this in early parts of the cave system, but no evidence whatsoever that we can find uh, for any connectivity to surface uh, in the uh, Dinaletti chamber, or even above the dragon's back chamber, as far as we can tell. Now, there are a few fracture systems that we have found that are about oh, three to six inches wide. Not wide enough for uh, Homo naledi to, to, to have gotten in, but maybe for bones to have gotten down. And we've dated those, and those fractures are filled with flowstone that is much older than the chamber itself. We now know the age of the chamber and the fossils in the chamber, and that flowstone is formed far before. So we know that that fracture wasn't open. Okay? So could it have been a death trap scenario? Well, not one in which animals fall into the chamber, but 
it's always possible that they crawled in there uh, and couldn't get back out. We cannot rule that out, so it has to remain a possibility. But the question is, why did they do it repeatedly? Why do you go into this really inaccessible, dark chamber uh, and get trapped? Not just one animal, which we could assume, that would make sense, or two animals, but 15 minimally, and we've only excavated half a meter by half a meter of the chamber, which produced 1,200 of the 1,500 bones. So it's a possibility, but I don't really think that that's the most likely possibility. Um, the last possibility is one that is our preferred option. I'll tell you, it's not the one that I would have jumped to at the beginning, but what it suggests is that maybe they, maybe they were intentionally put in there. Uh, and why would you do this? Well, possibly you are living at the entrance and uh, a member of your, your tribe or whatever it is uh, dies. Do you want uh, this animal to come sniffing around uh, where you're living? No, maybe not. So maybe you put it uh, where it can decay and not attract predators. I don't know. Uh, it's a possibility. But it's hard to imagine why we have so many uh, hominins in this chamber unless there's some deliberate component to it. So um, this is National Geographic's uh, fairly biblical uh, rendition of, of what they think is going on. Uh, now, of course, I don't follow that. Uh, I don't know what's, if that's true or not. I think it's a good possibility, uh, maybe not quite as graphically. Um, but what does this all mean? Well, uh, it's interesting in that we have uh, a human-like ancestor with a small brain. And of course, this sort of disrupts this common linear trend that we've had in human evolution of advancing uh, hominids getting larger and larger brains as we go. So maybe we need to start rethinking that. And certainly, uh, some of the other discoveries out of East Africa and China uh, and Asia point to the same thing. So this brings us to the last question. What is the age of Homo naledi? And when we published these papers originally, um, the media and the science community gave us an incredibly hard time because we didn't place a date on the fauna. And we said it could be somewhere in here, but morphologically it looks like it's probably uh, early Homo, or possibly it could even nudge out uh, Lucy, and it could be right at the base of our uh, tree. And so there's been a couple of papers written by other people uh, suggesting that based on the morphology, it must be here between uh, one and a half and two million years old, or one and two million years old. Um, so much to my chagrin and my colleague's chagrin, uh, National Geographic actually leaked our three papers that are coming out next week. Uh, and so you know, I'm not supposed to be talking about this because we have an embargo for the next two weeks. Um, but you can just see here, Homo naledi is only 250,000 years old. Um, uh, so I'm not saying this, uh, uh, <laughs> but we have some really exciting things coming up in about two weeks. Um, and uh, if you go and you have a look at some of these things, you will see on the internet, not for me, that we have a skeleton uh, that is in many ways more impressive and more complete than Lucy from a new chamber uh, with multiple individuals in another part of the cave system that's not connected. So is there a pattern here? Um, interesting. One of the big criticisms of our work originally was people thought, well, maybe you've taken an australopithecine and a, a homo and you've created a chimera. You've made up a new species that didn't really exist. You just had two in, two types of hominid. Well, I think this new skeleton, which is Naledi, pretty clearly demonstrates that it's not the case, as well as this absolutely amazing uh, new skull from the new chamber, which you didn't see from me. That's online. Uh, and I'm going to just skip through this for a moment. Um, in fact, I've, I've gone over my time. So I'm going to finish on this slide, which is how old is Homo Naledi? Um, and so this is sort of uh, a, a trend of the age of, of human ancestors with the oldest human ancestors. You have a nice display in the museum here that you can go and look at this. Going back to 7 million years or so, with most people thinking the, the real split, 
um, around four or five million years with uh, uh, sort of the beginning of what we think of our, as our Australopithecine uh, lineage. And so these are Australopithecines, and these are our own genus Homo. And based on the morphology and, and uh, the form of Naledi, it's really primitive. It is at our uh, base of our family tree, but the dates that I saw online are between about 200 and 300,000 years old, which is pretty shocking. And the reason for this, and I'll leave you with this, is for the last 100 years of, of paleoanthropology uh, and work on our own origins, we've had this assumption that humans essentially evolved in Africa uh, alone. There were no other uh, uh, hominids alongside humans for the last 200,000 years or so. Um, we know that's not true in Europe, where we have Neanderthals, Cro-Magnon man, uh, Denisovians. Um, but in Africa, to our knowledge, that's true. So much of the sort of archaeological record of when the first appearance of stone tools or of different types, advanced uh, tool making and, and cultural uh, advent comes along, I think these new discoveries that you'll read about in two weeks um, will really be interesting uh, and have to, we'll have to rethink a lot about African archaeology as well. So thanks very much. Sorry for going so long.